Good evening, everyone. I'm Claire O'Dowd. I'm research curator at the Henry Moore Institute. A very warm welcome to this evening's event, which is the first of our series of talks and discussions to accompany the exhibition Slip by Julia Crabtree and William Evans. Slip is showing at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds until the 16th of January. It is a fascinating and in some ways quite challenging exhibition, which delves very deeply into ideas of process, materials, ecologies and collaboration. And the events between now and January will explore some of these aspects of Julia and William's work in more detail. A very, very warm welcome tonight to Professor Laura Marks, who is a theorist and curator whose research focuses on media art, film and philosophy. Laura has published widely on aesthetics and the influence of the Arab world on European art and philosophy. And she's particularly well known for her work on haptic visuality, affect and bodily engagement with art and film, which has been hugely influential across a range of disciplines, including music, theatre and performance art, as well as visual arts and film studies. It's also a key area of interest for Julia Crabtree and William Evans, and something that they've spoken about a great deal in relation to the work in this exhibition. Laura's books include The Skin of the Film, Intercultural Cinema Embodiment and the Senses, published with Duke in 2000, Touch, Sensuous Theory and Multisensory Media, uh, published in 2002 with Minnesota Pre University of Minnesota Press, Enfoldment and Infinity, an Islamic Genealogy of New Media Art with MIT in 2010, and Hanan Al Cinema, Affections for the Moving Image with MIT in 2015. Laura's latest book, Enfolding Unfolding Aesthetics, From Your Body to the Cosmos, will be published with Duke University Press. Now, I'm especially excited about Laura's talk this evening because she's going to be looking at the exhibition from a really interesting theoretical perspective. So Laura's talk is rooted in her work relating to the philosophy of Deleuze and Guattari, as well as medieval Arabic texts on alchemy. And I am fascinated to hear where this will take us. So without further ado, I will hand over to Laura Marks to begin her talk, which is titled Julia Crabtree and William Evans Play the Abstract Line. All right. Thank you so much, Claire, for inviting me to talk about the wonderful artworks of uh, Julia Crabtree and William Evans and um, to uh, uh, really spend some time thinking of thinking deep into these artworks, even though um, uh, sadly I am not able to experience them uh, in person, which seems sort of a, um, a criminal for, uh, for works of such, uh, such uh, Great materiality. I'm looking forward to sharing these thoughts with you and uh, and to hearing your responses. So, um, Julia Crabtree and William Evans glass and ceramic works liberate line and shape to release unforeseen singularities. Their deep collaboration with materials, <clears throat> guided by a rigorous playfulness, liberates abstract lines lines that don't describe a pre-existing idea, but express the creativity of process. And I will contextualize their practice with Deleuze and Gattari's metallurgical philosophy, and also the medieval alchemy of Jaber ibn Hayyan, uh, as well as um, other process philosophy, as you will see. And uh, I'll attempt to explain why these artworks are so funny. Crabtree and Evans create a kind of friendly havoc in the gallery. Their glass and ceramic pieces repose on the floor or on a casually draped carpet. And I imagine there's a pleasing but disorienting informality for the visitors to the gallery. <clears throat> this carpet printed to look smoky, makes a haptic image that invites the viewer's gaze to soften and relax, which is a first physiological preparation for the mental relaxation, softening of judgment, and opening of mind that the exhibition as a whole invites. For we are invited to take part not in the exhibition of finished works, but in an ongoing process. Yes, the glass and ceramic pieces are hardened, and completed, 
but they reveal and celebrate the processes that produced them. Duckweed floats in some of the glass pieces, and outside the gallery, the weeds are allowed to grow for the duration of the exhibition, and I'm really curious uh, how that's going to turn out. As botanical life is invited to thrive, the difference between organic and non-organic life softens, and it's easier to think of the hard, mineral-based materials of glass and ceramic as also having a kind of life. We humans, too, enter these processes and, as I will suggest later, inhabit different ways of living and being a body. So one of these works that um, absolutely fascinates me is this stack of glossy ceramic pieces that look roughly the shape and dimension of toilet seat lids. The pastel colors call, also call to mind bathroom fixtures from another era, I think the 1980s. So we're hit by a lot of connotations. But looking more carefully, you see the smooth irregularities that reflect the light differently, perhaps finger marks, and you see that these are sculpted and not molded. They're curved and indented in the middle, kind of like a tongue. There is a banana yellow, soft peaches, a very pale grayish yellow, a grayish white, and the works are hollow, revealing breaks in their surface. You can also see that they've been glazed after breaking, showing the artist's acceptance and appreciation of these accidents. Slip is everything here. The liquid mixture of clay and water adheres to the plaster and, as the artists say, hardens like a smooth, shiny skin. So these works are a deep collaboration with materials. Uh, I understand that they're the results of a five-year period of experimentation. The artists seem to have been on a path of de-skilling, getting further away from sculptural form and closer to the affordances of materials. Prior to this period, Crabtree and Evans's works were more sculptural and architectural, sometimes designed using CGI. In the recent practice, there's more giving over to the materials and a certain embrace of entropy, and also a vigorous process-based reversal of entropy. So I will explain. So as background, I think the contemporary art's attitude toward glass and ceramics, which are traditionally crafts media, is one of slight embarrassment because it's so hard to shake the connotations of commercial and industrial fired wares and also those of craft ceramics and craft glass, in which a large part of the creativity lies in their decorative shapes and glazes. The contemporary art attitude consists of pretending that all the work is done by the materials and the, that the artist is just a facilitator of the process. The final work would be then the index of its process of production natural, physical, and chemical processes somewhat beyond the control of the artist. Rosalind Krauss has argued that this ad attitude resulted from the dominance of photography in visual art in the 1970s. Photography is a process of light, chemistry, and the apparatus, and the artist, the artist becomes a medium for these natural and industrial processes. Many contemporary artists rely on indexicality, the fact that if a sign was automatically caused, its cause must be real, even if we cannot interpret it. So this means letting go of human codes, symbols, and connotations. Long a trope of contemporary art, indexicality nevertheless re retains a disquieting, uh, non-human power. Uh, what Krauss calls the mute imprint of some uncoded thing. So there's a kind of entropy in this stepping back from control where the artist intervenes minimally and allows processes to reach a state of equilibrium. And in the resulting works of this contemporary art process I'm describing, 
there is a kind of austerity. And now they're interested in the powers of materials and the really creative possibilities that inhere in human material collaborations. And more than that, they're not afraid of cultural connotations. In glee, indeed, they gleefully layer them in, as I will discuss. Anyway, entropy is not inevitable. Uh, in far from equilibrium systems, new unpredictable patterns arise. And when you embrace process, you can actually be quite playful. The artists describe how they made the work heaves. Uh, whacking these forms around rebar to try and get them to behave in these kinds of flopping and collapsing ways. If the glass decides to collapse in a certain way, we just let that happen. The material is dictating the process, allowing bubbles, tension between maintaining movement to maintain form and where that form wants to go. So they're both collaborating with the properties of molten, gla molten glass and in the way they whack the forms around rebar, they're interfering with the properties, they're teasing it. Glass in its liquid form is uncannily ductile, in its solid form rigid and fragile. Glass form is formed by combining sand or silica with trona, lime, and other raw materials and melting them in a furnace. Uh, it's also sometimes made by burning down cullet or broken glass in a recycling process. And I don't know which process the artists use. But I do guess that that gorgeous sunflower yellow comes from adding uranium to the raw materials. Shaped while still semi-liquid, rapidly cooled or quenched to present, prevent crystallization, um, and the glass blowing and shaping molten glass is a dance of control and yielding between the artist and the material. Uh, glass making is a highly performative, time-sensitive relationship between the artist and the material in process. Ceramic affords the artist a satisfying interplay of control and accident that I think is rather different from glass. The clay medium allows the artist to model the objects as they want. Then the effects of glazing and firing introduce accidents. Ceramic involves many steps, decisions, and chance moments in the artist's collaboration with the material. I think it affords a different kind of intimacy between artist and material. Uh, ceramic is made by forming clay into the desired shape, allowing it to dry, glazing it, and firing it in a kiln at a temperature high enough between 350 and 800 degrees Celsius to change its molecular structure. So this is all stuff that I've learned very recently. What happens as ceramic heats is the residual water evaporates. Uh, then at 573 degrees Celsius, the chemical structure of silica or quartz changes, causing the wear to temporarily expand by about 2% and then later contract in the cooling, and this can be a source of cracking. At 900 degrees Celsius, the clay particles, the glass within the clay, begin to fuse in a process called sintering. So these artists work with bisque-fired clay, which is placed in a kiln, and the temperature is raised very slowly over many hours so that the water evaporates from the clay slowly with less danger of cracking, and then it's allowed to cool. Bisque doesn't get as, as hard as other ceramics, so it remains more porous, and the artists glaze the pieces with slip, a thin mixture of clay and water. Crabtree and Evans refer to the alchemy that occurs in the kiln, and this takes me to 9th century alchemist Jabir ibn Hayyan, who was a profound influence on European occult and mystical thought, as well as practical chemistry and medieval alchemy. His uh, Sabayin Kutub, or 70 books from the 9th century, were uh, translated to Latin as Liber de Septuaginta in the 12th century. And Jabir 
draws on this uh, very important pair of concepts in um, Islamic mysticism of a uh, zahir and batin, outside and inside, um, manifest and occult, exoteric and esoteric meanings. So Jabir theorized that every material substance contains its opposite uh, in a hidden fashion. And this view synthesized um, Islamic and Greek Neoplatonist thought. Uh, the writings of um, Pseudo-Democritus and Synesius, the Greek Neoplatonists, regarded natures or virtues or powers, which they called physias, as being hidden within matter, and they need to be extracted. And uh, Jabir layers the concepts of Zehir and Bat Betin on top of these ideas. So Zehir and Betin also connote circumference and center, implying that alchemical transformation is a matter of turning something inside out. And the alchemists used these ideas because they considered that cold, uh, that silver was cold and dry uh, on the outside, hot and wet on the inside, and that gold was the opposite. So that they should be able to get gold by inverting silver through various operations. And the 70 books attributed to Jabir explain how to analyze metals by corroding them with strong reagents like ammonium chloride, urine, and vinegar, uh, fermenting, distilling, and other processes to release their inner elements, fire, air, water, and earth, and produce transmutative elixirs. So, Thus, it was, thus, alchemy draws on this uh, Islamic mystical thought um, in order to try to release the latent gold from other metals. And um, although alchemy did uh, ultimately um, transmute into the modern discipline of chemistry, um, those scientific experiments were uh, a manifestation of um, mystical and, uh, and spiritual uh, understandings of um, the nature of the world. So the alchemy of the kiln reaches into the material and draws out its potential higher state. Now I want to talk about bodies. Uh, ceramic has more in common with an organic body than glass does. Clay itself is a flexible medium, its consistency close to that of skin and muscle. Crabtree and Evans' ceramics are full of jokes, often quite crude ones, about the medium's similarity to human bodies. Uh, they state that they have appropriated mass-produced goods designed to support the body, uh, like these objects that I just uh, cannot get enough of looking at, smooth white forms that look like they would be nice to sit on, or kind of like a, a bum pushing out to meet your own bum. Um, but they also have a, a tongue-like look. Um, and some of the pretty golden glass works look a little bit like condoms. There are also um, these rough snakes. Um, made, I believe, by putting clay into sausage casings that, um, as other critics have also remarked, resemble well-shaped excrement and actually invite a lot of uh, admiration of how consistent and high quality they are. I noticed that uh, Ray Conker has remarked on these artworks similarity to turds and sausages. So, for sure, feeling our similarity to other materials can give us humans an awareness of our own mortality. Definitely the, the artists are playing with abjection, um, making permanent the tem temporary shapes that human bodies produce. Elsewhere in the exhibition, those snaky shapes are alert, like curious snakes, or uh, walking on long skinny legs of rebar, and it's fun to anthropomorphize them. It's almost impossible not to. They're adorably sympathetic, these squashed and shrugging, 
languid and smug, tender, cute, and slightly aggressive shapes. I feel like I could assign a character to each one of them. Still, the artworks also invite us to more subtly test what it might feel like to be shaped like them. They invite us to step out of our human comfort zone and feel like their materiality, to empathize with them. And here's where the concept of abstract line comes in. A line that does not outline a figure, but exhibits its own capacities for doing and feeling. In the thought of uh, Deleuze, uh, uh, Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattari, the abstract line is the companion form of haptic space, a perceptual field that invites the eyes not to look at figures from a distance, but to draw close and almost touch, touch them. Haptic space and abstract line are subsets of what Deleuze and Gattari call smooth space, or space that's organized intensively um, rather than by forms imposed from the outside. And both abstract line and haptic space invite a viewer to feel with the art form in an embodied way, instead of responding cognitively to what the art depicts. Uh, Deleuze and Gattari say abstract line does not delimit, uh, does not delimit a figure, but ha has its own independent life. A line that delimits nothing, that describes no contour, uh, that is constantly changing direction. I should wait for the siren. That is alive as a continuous variation. Such a line is truly an abstract line and describes a smooth space. They say the abstract line liberates a power of life that human beings had rectified and organisms had confined and which matter now expresses as a trait, flow, or impulse traversing it. Uh, so this is, this is about um, liberating line even from form. And it's funny to think about uh, hard and permanent works of glass and ceramic uh, doing that. But, um, but I think they do because they challenge, um, they challenge an idea of form as, we, as, it's, um, as it pre-exists in the mind. And that's what I'm going to talk about shortly. So that rather than project our own life on these funny and challenging objects, and that's what anthropomorphism is, rather than do that, we can feel their, their life and feel what we have in common with non-organic life. Uh, yeah. These works release unforeseen singularities. I'm going to change the picture again. To use the term of process philosophy, uh, singularities are the events that occur when an entity individuates in relation to its milieu. Uh, unlike industrial ceramics and glass, these works respond to their environment and to the artist's interventions and they're allowed to retain their individuality. Uh, Deleuze and Gattari's central example is of, uh, of how artists work with matter that is in flux uh, and allow matter to express its singularities uh, comes from the Dogon miners and metallurgists of Mali who follow the matter flow of iron uh, and work with its qualities, such as the way iron ore composes with sedimentary rocks and iron's capacity to be smelted and tempered. And they argue that this kind of artisanal knowledge um, that connects with the, the powers of the earth does not impose form on matter, but collaborates with matter's latent powers. So I, I mentioned the earth. Uh, and of course, uh, our planet, you know, with its, uh, its metals, its uh, water, uh, air, electricity, uh, our planet is cosmic 
and corresponds to other parts of the cosmos. And the process philosopher Gilbert Simondon says, in some cases, cosmic forces, or forces that, what he calls forces that do not depend on the human being, co-modulate with human forces. He observes this in technical practices like agriculture, nursing, and wind-powered navigation. So these are technologies that don't dominate nature, but respond to the singularities of nature. And uh, clearly, the, the way Crabtree and Evans work with, um, with glass and with ceramic uh, are co-modulating with um, cosmic forces in their kind of exploring and yielding to the properties of these materials. So most technological processes, certainly industrial ones, dominate matter and impose a preconceived form on matter, uh, such as mass-produced ceramic toilets. So they are following the Aristotelian concept that matter is passive and that form, which is an abstraction, is active, so that human abstract intention imposes it itself on passive, meaningless nature, where matter is thought of as potentiality and form is thought of as actuality. And you can hear the kind of uh, gender politics of this uh, Aristotelian division between passive matter and active form. This relationship is thoroughly overturned in Crabtree and Evans' work. They treat matter as alive and having a certain kind of knowledge and agency. They're interested and curious about what it will do. As uh, Henri Faucillon said, matters have a certain calling. And I think uh, Crabtree and Evans are cultivating the calling of matters. Um, they are celebrating becoming, which to paraphrase Simon Don, is a mode of resolving an initial incompatibility that was rife with potentials without diminishing those potentials. So this really describes physical and chemical processes. The many potentialities in the clay, uh, the artist's um, interactions with the material, the heat, etc., encourage unpredictable new uh, beings to emerge. And similarly with glass, um, there's an, it, when you embrace chance, you can actualize potentials that were kind of waiting in the material. As it happens, process philosophy until the last century was developed more thoroughly in East and West Asia than it was in Western countries. I focus on the process thought of the Persian 17th century philosopher Sadr al-Din al-Shirazi, or Sadra. For Sadra, existence is a process of modulation or individuation, uh, which he calls tashkik al-wujud, the modulation of, of being. Uh, and individuation, or tashakus, comes from the word shak, or to doubt which is really interesting because it means that when something is individuating, it's kind of doubting what it has been um, and um, trying to get to something that, uh, um, that is less, less uh, doubtful. <laughs> so individuation is a way of becoming more true. In Sadra's universe, becoming is singular. So we think of things as belonging to categories, and this is also from Aristotle, you know, such as a rock or a tree or an animal. But Sadra argues that this is merely a mental convenience. Um, in fact, Sadra says, what things are is structures of events that move from general and indeterminate to definite and concrete. Uh, he says that uh, we often mistake the form um, for the becoming, and that's just because the form is easy to recognize cognitively. You can put a name to it, while becoming 
is something that you have to intuit. Sadra explains how entities individuate, becoming more and more real and more and more intense, and also being things that can no longer be named. And I think this is this applies perfectly to the, the objects that um, Crabtree and Evans uh, have made, that um, each of them is so singular that you, you, can you can work hard to describe it, but you really can't put a name to any of these things. They're not vases, they're not toilet seats. So Sadra argues that um, uh, the flow of being, which he thinks is the, the kind of the flow that powers the universe, and it is sort of driven, divinely driven, uh, the flow of being intensifies the specificity of a thing and makes it more real and makes it more like itself. And I just love that, that becoming is actually a process of being, becoming more like yourself, becoming you know, less, less abstract, less cliched less like anything else. Sadra's process philosophy shows the unreality of categories and abstractions, while the flow of being, which cannot be grasped conceptually but only sensed, is real. He says, existences are the principal realities, whereas quiddities, or the names of things, uh, have never smelled the perfume of real existence. So again, for Sadra, being fully individuated means being most real. And so what this means for the works of Crabtree and Evans is that to the degree that they cultivate unique and accidental properties of the materials and allow objects to escape from recognizable and nameable forms, these objects are more real than other objects. They are singularities. I love encountering singularities in my everyday life. For example, picking up a leaf and uh, being quite sure that no leaf looks exactly like this one. Raindrops have never made a pattern on a window exactly like this before. Um, maybe nobody else has made an omelet with uh, nablusi cheese, golden beets, and um, uh, I've got to add another ingredient um, of, oh, I can't do it. A singular omelet, anyway, that nobody has ever eaten before. Uh, I know for sure that nobody has ever repaired a broken chair, like the one I'm sitting on now, with rags, glue, and a pencil in exactly the way I did it. And it just makes me happy that the world is full of singularities even as small as these, especially as people rightly worry that uh, capitalist culture imposes uniform experiences um, that may well have the, the psychic effect of uh, dulling the imagination, uh, which includes dulling the political imagination. So it encourages optimism that singularities are actually more common than uniformity. You just need to, uh, to look out the window or engage with, uh, with materials in their process of, um, of transformation and becoming to see that singularity is really um, the name of the game and, uh, and uniformity, whether it's from uh, Aristotelian categories or from uh, um, industrial mass production, is the exception to how things are. It encourages optimism, did I just say this? It encourages optimism that singularities are actually more common than uni uniformity. It encourages hope that difference and individuation ultimately can't be controlled by human powers and institutions. Macro scale events like voting do affect massive change, but internally they are full of singularities, like what somebody had for breakfast on voting day. Of course, to be politically significant, singularities need to gather together. I think that what art does is inspire a taste for singularities, uh, helping to liberate our minds and imaginations from forms and cliches so that we may be prepared for the political moment of collective 
singularization. So those are kind of grand claims. In conclusion, I'll attempt to explain why these artworks are so funny. Back to form. The ideal form of glass is, so the, the abstract mental form, is that it be smooth, consistent, and clear, bending as though naturally to platonic forms like cylinders, cones, and spheres. And glassmaking history seems to be about getting glass to conform to this ideal and repressing the qualities that develop in non-ideal conditions. What makes it funny is that form is revealed to be unimaginative and not an equal to the emergent properties of glass. Also funny is the artist's attitude toward glass, friendly, curious, and aggressive, uh, as though the material is not something to be subjugated, but an equal partner in play that still retains its mystery. I think ceramic is funny in a different way. The ideal forms of ceramic are now closely linked to their industrial purposes. The bathroom ceramics that the artists playfully refer to, and also the deadly serious ceramic surfaces of missiles. Um, at uh, Alfred University in upstate New York, I learned some time ago when I used to live near there, the ceramic department produces both artisanal ceramics and high-tech ceramics for military applications. Such purposes apply the molecular properties of ceramic toward human ends. Crabtree and Evans do not ply, but play with those properties. They refer ceramics to its toilety human purposes, but then they explore what ceramics and human bodies actually have in common. Our rounded, strong, but mortal bodies are smooth, pliable, and vulnerable skins. I think these works by Crabtree and Evans invite us to feel a common striving, a desire to overcome the bounds of naming, as Sadra wrote, and instead to individuate, to respond to our milieu all the way down to the molecular level, to become singular. All this while we remain acutely aware of our mortality and feel the passing of change. Uh, to feel a solidarity, perhaps, with other beings, organic and inorganic. Thank you, that's it. Laura, thank you so much for that. That was incredible. I've been scribbling notes frantically throughout your talk, and I agree with so much of what you've just said. And I think also that um, Julia Crabtree and William Evans would agree with in a lot of what you've just said. Um, it's a fascinating way to look at the exhibition. Um, while um, our audience are formulating their questions for you, and please everybody do um, ask your questions through the chat function, we would love to hear your thoughts and comments and questions for Laura. Um, but I wanted to ask you a bit more about some of the, the things that you've been talking about. Um, um, I was really interested in what you were saying about bodies and becoming uh, and like the idea of becoming throughout this is really interesting because it seems to me um, having had the advantage of walking around the exhibition that that is an exhibition that was in the process of becoming for a very long time and is still becoming in in the space of the gallery. The, the, the plants are still growing inside the glass containers. There are there were things growing outside the gallery until we had snow and frost recently, but there are things growing, there are things becoming. Um, but what, what I wanted to ask you about is this, um, it, is the relationship of bodies to becoming and specifically the body of the, the viewer. Like, what what is the effect of this on the body of the viewer as we pass through these spaces with these objects that are in this state of kind of flux and change and and so on and so forth mm -hmm. I wondered yeah. if you could say a bit more about that that relationship mm -hmm. yeah I, I can only do it uh, imaginatively yeah <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough ask I think yeah. 
unfortunately. I have the impression, as, as I mentioned, that, um, that the exhibition is, um, is very disarming and you may be even aggressively disarming. I imagine that some people feel very uncomfortable walking into that space with the, the carpet. You know, the carpet is yes. new, it's draped on something. You know, it, it has that, uh, that smoky look. So it is, uh, you know, playing a little bit, you know, just talking about the carpet alone, it seems to be playing a little bit with abjection, you know, looking you know, you know, looking uh, um, having this kind of discontinuous pattern on its surface, but it also, I imagine, um, when your feet um, are pressing in or your shoes are pressing into that soft surface instead of clicking on the hard, you know, concrete surface of a gallery floor, I think that would be disarming, um, maybe in a maybe in a comforting way. And just kind of loosen loosen a visitor up a little bit, uh, and then of course you know the objects are on the floor. I think they're all on the floor, right? Um, mm -hmm. If I were there, I would I would sit down. Um, uh, I would sit down on the floor and uh, get as close to the objects as I was as I was allowed to. Um, and I think that you know they have a scale that's. Um, uh, you know, sympathetic to human scale. Mm. So I think you could um, spend time with the objects and, and just, um, you know, like you have to sort of experience, you know, we always be begin cognitively, I think. Uh, so you'd experience, um, you know, looking for the connotations, you know, enjoying the jokes about, uh, you know, toilets and things. Um, but then as you spend more time, I think you would, um, or uh, one would, I, I would try to um, experience a bodily empathy where instead of relating to that thing as another object, um, I would try to think of how we are both um, beings together with our, with our properties that we have in, in common. Uh, I mentioned some of them, you know, uh, weight, skins, fragility, but also strength. So I think that I think that uh, being with being with these artworks and, and the way that they're installed in the gallery would um, kind of loosen up our way of occupying our own body, um, you know, make make us aware of our mortality, but also. Um, be uh, be interested and curious about the um, bodily experience of non-organic things. Yeah, that's really interesting because I know that a lot of what you talk about in terms of sort of haptic visuality relates to this idea of empathy and about being able to empathize with non-organic things. And you do become forced to in many ways within this exhibition. And I think that the thing about the carpet is fascinating because it is deliberately disconcerting. The first thing you do when you enter that exhibition is walk on an artwork, which is what we are trained not to do. You know, we're trained not to touch and not to, not to definitely not to walk on things. So yeah, that is a deliberate way of putting people into that kind of mindset I think um, and you describe it so perfectly um, the, the bodily the idea of the the abjection as well is a really interesting one in this because as you say when you're in touch with that kind of um, that side of human existence that you know our own mortality you have to become vulnerable in a certain way. Um, I know I wanted to ask you a bit more about that because th th there's a kind of vulnerability all the way through this, both the artists and their materials and the viewer are placed in positions of vulnerability. Um, and I wondered if we could if we could maybe unpack that a bit more in terms of empathy as well. Mm. Uh, I don't know, you, you've said it so well, Claire, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think um, uh, I like to focus on um, uh, physical empathy before thinking about um, emotional empathy. Uh, so just thinking about 
you know, because that, that puts us all on a similar level um, where you know, we all have bodies, you know, we are all subject to processes uh, and to decay. So it's actually kind of funny that um, uh, non-organic uh, objects or bodies, if you want, like a, a glass or ceramic work, um, they will probably live for longer than us <laughs> in, their, in their current state. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have that much to, to <laughs> add to what we've said, but um, uh, I think be, you know, because the work is so process-based and because what happened in the process of making both the glass and the ceramic works is, um, is evident to the visitor, I think they could invite us to feel about our own um, bodies, bodies in the process. Yeah, that's an interesting thought as well. Um, we are we are getting some really interesting questions through in the chat. So I'm going to try and pose a couple of these to you, if that's all right. Um, so we have a, one question about Alfred North Whitehead considered that points in space do not exist, but are the meeting place of volumes. Whitehead was a mathematician and the teacher of Russell. How does this relate to the ideas of Sadra? Mm -hmm. Can yeah. you help? <laughs> I, I can. Uh, th thank you, S uh, Simon. I've actually been doing quite a lot of work on um, uh, the meeting points between Whitehead and Sadra and uh, where, they, where they agree and where they disagree. And I, I've been trying to construct a, a process philosophy that draws on them and also on on the thought of uh, Edouard Glissant. Well, I mean, what Whitehead, uh, what I most grab from Whitehead that I think relates to to what you're saying, uh, that uh, there, the points in space do, do not exist. So they're like abstract, abstract forms. Um, I really enjoy um, Whitehead's uh, argument that um, entities are, uh, uh, are occasions. So he um, uh, allows us to think of any existing thing by calling it an occasion, you know, a, co a concrescence of all these other things that come together in, uh, in one entity's um, prehension. You can start to think of how, how alive every entity is, you know, whether it's a person or a ceramic work or indeed a, a Zoom meeting. Um, and how uh, a constant process is um, is uh, shaping these things, and and for in Whitehead's case, you know, in every moment they're created anew um, as every new individuation happens. And I personally prefer um, Sadra's and um, Simon Dong's uh, flow-based uh, philosophy to Whitehead's. Um, uh, atomism but yeah that that's a, a very close it's a very close meeting thank you very much for that um and um the next question uh is from tom and he is asking how do you begin to understand and interpret such works from afar in the, <laughs> you are transatlantic do you work solely from the images or does that process for you require different layers of research? Uh, so how do you approach this in the context of the role of materiality? Yeah. And that is a really good question because we, we set you a really difficult task. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th thank you so much for asking, Tom. Um, yeah, it's tough because, you know, I, 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 take, I take my job I, you know, as an art critic seriously. Um, and you know, for when I'm talking about like three-dimensional artworks and two-dimensional too, of course. Um, uh, uh, and for that matter, of uh, films, you actually have to watch films, you know, in person in the appropriate circumstance. So uh, I wasn't able to do that. So it requires um, when you're looking as carefully as I can at the pictures. Um, it requires a lot of imaginative reconstruction, 
um, and really a kind of imagined embodiment. And I have sort of, you know, kind of exercises to um, uh, um, imaginatively embody what it's like to be in a space or, or with with something. Mm -hmm. So doing those things that that is that's the kind of um, uh, research that I I do. I know quite a bit about ceramics now. I mean, already not so much about glass. So um, you're learning about the nature of the materials and how they are worked at least a little bit. It gets me closer to them. But the thing, uh, the thing that uh, I really try not to do, um, and that I, I discourage my students from doing um, as as much as possible, is to begin with a concept because I find that concepts really block engagement with something. And you can, you know, concepts are great. You know, obviously, I, I was using a lot of concepts in this talk, but I, I think concepts, they need to come later. They need to come after you kind of disarm and get close to the thing and learn about it on its own terms. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I think as art historians and art critics and theorists, we have to do those kind of imaginative leaps quite often it, it's kind of part of the process isn't it but that everyone has different tools for dealing with those it's wonderful to hear how you do it um our next question is from chris horak who asks the objects remind me a bit of hans arp and henry moore although these artists are clearly working in a different medium do you see a connection or the attitude uh postmodern more of parody that's my dear friend, Chris. Hi, Chris. I'm so glad you're here. Um, what, and what a great question. That is a great question. It is a great question. Yeah, and I hadn't even reflected on the fact that these are, these are being shown at the Henry Moore Foundation. Um, it's really a great question. Uh, and I did, um, and I, I mentioned how the artists are playing with um, with connotations of um, uh, you know industrial sculpture, but um, industrial sculpture like toilets. Um, but I, I hadn't thought about how their work relates to um, modernist biomorphic sculpture. It's really a good question. Um, I don't. I don't think they're doing parody. Um, I, I, I'm not sure though. It's, and you know, these, I don't think these works, like these works are, are funny, but actually, you know, actually I think may, maybe they are a little bit. I think maybe they, you know, just as they draw on the industrial connotations and kind of make fun of them, um, perhaps they, yeah, in fact, the more I think about your question, Chris, I think you're right. I think they they are referring to those modernist forms because there really is a lot of intention, especially around those um, those uh, white biomorphic uh, forms that we all like to use in the the um, uh, the central picture. They really do call to mind that modernist desire to make something that kind of captured the essence of biomorphism without resembling anything. Mm -hmm. That is really interesting. I, I hadn't thought about them in those terms, actually. I know we are the Henry Moore Institute. <laughs> I actually hadn't thought about that rela potential relationship between those. That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah. I, th I think the artists, are, um, they're really, really excellent at kind of channeling different influences. Yeah, and it's so interesting, like in relation to what I was saying about, um, you know, the contemporary moment. Um, yeah. Um, where artists, um, you know, which, I, which I, I actually find very dispiriting, where uh, artists, and, and this is still going on, where artists say, oh, it, it's not me. You know, it's just the materials that I'm facilitating by way of this technology, so this kind of disavowing of artist agency. But that is a, you know, that is a response 
to um, to the loss of the loss of faith in modernism, you know, yeah. the loss of faith, the faith that the artist could like you know you know impose their their will on uh, uh, on materials and make something you know that like expressed a, a, some sort of an essence. Yeah, I th I th yeah. I think that there's that kind of push and pull in this exhibition between those two things very much between those two poles, and it's kind of an interesting, I don't know, dialectic between them. Maybe I don't know. It's it's a that's a really interesting point. Um, it's just been pointed out to me that we do actually have a Henry Moore exhibition alongside Slip in another part of the gallery at the same time. <laughs> So you can also see Henry Moore at the Institute at the moment. Um, one final question. We are, we are somewhat running out of time, but we, we have one final question. How have you interpreted the title of the exhibition, Slip? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's such a great title. It's a pun. It because uh, Slip is that, um, that mixture of clay and water that you use to, uh, to coat a ceramic before firing it you know and it's an alternative to glaze um but also it's about like uh uh you know slipping you know slipping and falling having a prat fall um uh you know it, it could even be a command to <laughs> come to our exhibition and, and slip and and let down your guard mm. Yeah, that's a really, really good way of looking at it. I, I also thought of it in terms of like sort of um, slippage, uh, like slips of the tongue and slippages, because the language has such a really key role in the work and in, you know, the titles and the choice of titles and the way things are kind of described and so on. So there, there was that aspect of it as well. Um, yeah. yeah. I left language out of my talk almost entirely. <laughs> that, that is an entirely, that's another hour. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, well, we are, I think, over time, and that is actually a really nice point to end on, I think. Um, Laura, thank you so much. This was an absolutely fascinating evening. Really, thank really you. interesting Thank you so much talk. for inviting me. It was a, such, such a pleasure to... Uh, and to engage with these works as well as I could. And I, I do very much envy uh, all of you who are who are there and, and able to experience in person, but, but thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, and thank you to everybody uh, for watching and for your incredibly insightful questions. But for now, a massive thank you to Laura Marks uh, and it's good night from all of us. <laughs>